Hello and welcome to HLA Live. This is the seventh episode of HLA Live, which is our weekly program broadcast live on the HLA YouTube channel. Each week we talk to interesting people from the HLA community and beyond about issues and topics that our community have expressed an interest in. The HLA has six pillars of leadership that we deliver our programs on. The leader is a communicator, the leader is a manager, the leader is a negotiator, the leader is an innovator and entrepreneur, the leader is a follower, the leader as a philosopher. Many of the episodes in HLA Live will cover one or, many or more of these pillars. This week's talk, we are, uh, this week's episode, we're talking about African and Caribbean influences on the NHS. This week's topic was as a result of the work of HLA scholars Olamide Dada through the project she brought into the HLA, which was her project. In 2017, she founded Melanin Medics, which began as a blog with the sole purpose of increasing the representation of African and Caribbeans in medicine. The platform quickly grew and the need for an organisation providing support and positive representation was identified. To get today, the organisation has grown significantly, reaching thousands of young people in the UK through outreach and hundreds of African and Caribbean current and future doctors. Melanin Medics has identified that Africans and Caribbeans in medicine face a number of challenges on their career journeys and need to be better supported. Melanin Medics provides a practical support through a number of programs, events, engagements, outreach, networking opportunities and mentorship in order to fulfill their mission and address what we perceive to be a pressing issue. Olamide has put together tonight's episode of HLA Live with Pedra, Eamon and the rest of the HLA Live team and brought together a fabulous panel of speakers to talk about this important topic. So handing over to Olamide, chairing tonight's panel. Olamide. Thank you very much, Johan. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Johan said, my name is Olamide Dada. It's such a great honour to be chairing this evening's panel discussion. And just to share a little bit of a background um, in the run up to this event, there was a, a lot of work that was involved and a lot of research and one thing that we were unanimous in seeing was that actually not much had been documented on this topic on the area of African and Caribbean influences on the NHS and it showed to us just how important a discussion like this evening's one is as well as this is an area that hasn't been explored fully or properly recognized as it should have been and I do think this evening's discussion is important for two reasons the first being that these types of discussions are often limited to Black History Month or Windrush Day. And yes, they are significant events and they are worth celebrating, but actually it is really important to just recon recognize how integral African and Caribbean healthcare professionals have been to the N NHS. The second reason I think this evening's discussion is very important is just how diverse our panel is. And our panel represents people who have practiced within the healthcare sector for a number of years and left incredible legacies, people who are creating ch change and people who have trained overseas, and also people who will go on to change healthcare systems as we know it and change perspectives along the way. It is very important to recognize that this is a journey and we can't deny that African and Caribbean history has been tainted by racism within the healthcare sector and within this country, but we are hopeful that things are changing. For many of our audience today, our cultural background has played a big part in our decision to pursue careers in the healthcare sector, whether it be to better care for our communities, tackle health inequalities, or preventing the same thing that has happened to a loved one from ever happening again. Our history and the part African and Caribbean healthcare professionals have played in the NHS are important to recognize. I have no doubt that this evening's discussion will be both informative and very insightful. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Frances Day Stirk. Frances is Jamaican born. She qualified as a nurse and midwife in England with over 30 years of midwifery experience. She's a former member of the executive management team of the Royal College of Midwives and president of the International Confederation of Midwives. She is also a trustee at the Tropical Health and Education Trust. Please welcome Frances Day Stirk as she shares her story with us this evening. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction Olamide and for the invitation to be here. 
Um, I'm here because uh, I think it was Pedro heard me speak at the FET conference in 2018, and I'm really delighted to share my story. Well, the, the multi-ethnic nature of the NHS is not a new phenomenon, is it? Health workers have been coming to the UK from across the Commonwealth for centuries, for decades, and many were from the colonial countries, including Africa and the Caribbean. My own experience is of leaving Jamaica to go to the UK to study and later on to work within the healthcare system. And it's a story that's common to many diaspora. So we all know that the NHS turned 70 in 2018, and it was founded the same year, 1948, same year as the Nationality Act. And it was designed to recruit colonial residents to come to Britain to help with post-war reconstruction. And since then, many health workers and trainees have come to call the UK their home and have contributed immeasurably to the health and well-being of the country. I believe that the historical debt of the NHS owed to the Caribbean and Commonwealth countries cannot be ignored, but I'd just like to share a little of my story. So I was the second in my family to venture overseas to study, the second to make the journey to England. My uncle, enticed to England during the Windrush period, lasted all of six months before returning home, and I won't tell you what he said. Anyway, it was with great pride that all my family waved me off at the airport. It was a big event. In those days in Jamaica, to go to the airport was huge. I was the first sibling and the second in my family to venture overseas to study. I was 18 years old. And like many of my school friends, left our island home to study. Some went to Canada, to USA, Spain, Mexico, and others like me headed to the UK. And our intention was to study, to learn, and to return. And I was meant to be away for more, no more than about four or five years. I knew I wanted to study general nursing. I wanted to do pediatrics and midwifery. And one of the nurses that I worked with in the office I worked before I came said, and Miss Day, make sure you do theatres before you come back. It was an exciting and tearful exodus. And as I gazed out the window at the beautiful Caribbean Sea, my heart was really heavy. The BOAC flight, as British Overseas Corporation, stopped in the Bahamas and Bermuda before arriving in London on a cloudy, wintry December day. It was gray, it was foggy, it was cold. Not something that I'd experienced before. I did have a coat brought from Canada by my friend. It did its best, but the wind at Paddington Station seeped into my bones as I waited for the train to take me south. I enjoyed the study and the camaraderie of the nursing home, but I longed for home. And there were just so many times that I wanted to give up, to go home, but the overriding drive was not to let my family down. And so I persevered. After three years punctuated by homesickness, I developed a resilience that saw me through climate, cultural and culinary differences, and I qualified as a nurse before pursuing midwifery education. Now that journey took me on a career path that included um, a short stint working in hospital um, as, a, as a nurse, very short. Then I did um, community midwifery and then midwifery management and midwifery education. And then later on becoming director of the Royal College of Midwives and latterly as president of the International Confederation of Midwives. So I know my experience is not unique. It's actually a diaspora experience, but you know, my coming here was 40 years ago and the world has changed since I came to England. Not only are there nonstop BA flights, well, between London and Kingston, well, not during COVID, I tell you, but unimaginable advances in technology, the advent of the internet and social media. And now we are faced with sort of two really looming um, things, the pandemics, I will call them. One is COVID and one is Black Lives Matter. Uh, I don't need to mention the twin events that they have had and will have on our world. Now, the only people of color in the town where I studied were students. They were either at the hospital or at the local college, apart from one Trinidadian woman who was married to a local man. I think she was very lonely and she was really glad to see us. Well, we were mainly from Jamaica and Trinidad. Most of us returned, most returned to their home countries, but later migrated to North America soon after. I found the staff and patients welcoming and curious. Many patients would ask, where do you come from? I had Africa, 
Burma, Wales, and sometimes it was the Caribbean. My first experience of racism was not in the NHS, but on the tube when my fiance, who's white, and I were abused. Other experiences came when trying to find accommodation. He would find somewhere, it would be all okay. And then when I went with him to view, suddenly it was no longer available. However, these incidents were infrequent. My own interesting incident, I will call it, happened soon after I moved to London and I was doing agency work at a large London hospital. One night on duty, I was very excited to see someone who looked like me, but I made the mistake of asking the black nurse where she was from. I was very firmly put in my place. She was black British and resented my question that had assumed she was a foreigner. And I had, I was looking for some comrade comradeship. My earlier experiences had led me to conclude that black nurses were like my colleagues and I from somewhere overseas, but it was a lesson learned. I think it was Aristotle, I'm not sure, who said, he who assumes make an ass of you and me. Now we know that Western countries are often accused of poaching health professionals with the pull factors, prospect of better pay, working conditions, education and career progression. Yet many health professionals decisions are actually based on push factors and they migrate out of the profession or out of the country due to limited career opportunities, poor working environments, poor pay, lack of resources, commodities, and continuing professional development opportunities. I believe that the majority of the diaspora, like myself, had every intention of returning to the health system of their country of origin. However, life intervenes and at times conspires to thwart best intentions. I married secretly, and did not return as planned. I was not pushed, rather pulled by personal circumstances. Throughout my, my career, I can say that I've not experienced overt racism. Of course, there were times, like when I was a head of midwifery, that people often assumed that I was a secretary and my secretary who was white was the head of midwifery. She was Irish and we often had a good laugh at that. The NHS and its values of equity and fairness can rightly be seen as a good healthcare model of choice for countries around the world. And as we engage globally, the NHS needs to do more to recognize the impact that recruiting health workers from overseas has on those countries. If we are to hold true to these values, as well as for the black and minority ethnic staff employed within the NHS today, now, the Nursing Association of Jamaica, UK, states on their website their commitment to influence healthcare and broaden the prospects of BME nurses is evident in the continued grants and bursaries issued by them. There are BME nurses and midwives who need their support to progress in their career. Now, I have to say, I am very proud of those who have reached the pinnacle of their careers like my friend Dame Carleen Davis, who's a former Secretary General of the Royal College of Midwives, who was the first black female trade union leader, Professor Jackie Dunkley Bent, the very first Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS, Dame Donna Kinnear uh, of the RCN, who's now the um, Secretary General. She's a third black British fem black female trade union leader. The one before at the RCN was an American, Beverly Malone, but it's great to have these visible role models. But these women are few and far between and more needs to be done to remedy the underrepresentation of BME staff in senior leadership roles. Now, a few years ago, it was Donna Kinnear who said, there are sadly too few of us. There were only 10 black, Asian and minority ethnic chief nurses across the whole of the NHS in England. And the leadership of the NHS is not reflected of the workforce or the communities we serve. I don't know how many of you saw the BBC documentary in 2018 that told the story of the thousands of Caribbean and African women who answered the call 70 years ago. And their tale was a tale of struggle to overcome racism, their fight for career progression and their battle for nat national recognition. But I think it was also a celebration of their resilience and determination. But I know that my story is but one in the history of black and minority ethnic health personnel who've been the backbone of the NHS for decades. I acknowledge that my name, Frances Day, would have opened doors that remained closed 
to those with obvious foreign sounding names. I know that I had to work twice as hard to achieve what I did. But I also know that I am a small part of a long and enduring history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis, for such an incredibly told story. It's great to hear about your journey and just your resolve at this point in time. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dame Elizabeth Anionwu. Professor Dame Elizabeth Anionwu was a nurse, health visitor, and the first UK sickle cell nurse specialist before becoming a professor of nursing. Since retirement, she has published her memoirs, Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union, and she is a life patron for the Mary Sequel Trust and a patron of the Sickle Cell Society. Professor Dame Elizabeth will be sharing her story with us this evening. Please welcome Elizabeth. Thank you very much indeed, Dalama Day. Um, it's a huge pleasure to, to join this fantastic panel this evening. And thank you for inviting me. So I want to follow on with using a theme that um, Frances has, has, has pulled out in her very interesting uh, presentation. And that is <laughs> her, her um, understanding and insight into why her very pleasant, uh, uh, inquisitive question of, of asking a black nurse, where are you from? And the offense it caused within that individual. Um, I, I'd like to start with a very similar story uh, as a child, because I was born in this country, I'm mixed race. And my, the title of my memoirs, Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union, is because I'm actually the product of an affair of two students whilst they were at Cambridge University in the 1940s. One was obviously my mother who was white of Irish heritage, but born and brought up in this country. My father, oh sorry, my mother was studying classics at Newnham College. My father was Nigerian who was studying law at Trinity College. Cambridge University. Now, they didn't get married. And my mother was in her second year of studies. And when her mother, my maternal grandmother, realized to her utter horror that her daughter was pregnant, all my mother would say was the father was a fellow student at Cambridge University, zilch, nothing else. Let's speed up to the day that I was born and that my grandparents came to visit me and the Irish nun stopped them in their tracks before allowing them into the room, turned round to them and said, ah, to be sure the baby's a little dark. And that was the first time that well, my parents, my grandparents realized it wasn't going to be a white granddaughter. It was a brown skinned granddaughter. Now, my mother never ever rejected me. My family, my maternal family never rejected me, but life was very difficult for my mother. She decided to leave college. That's why I spent the first nine years of my life in this country in a children's home, a Catholic children's home run by nuns in Birmingham. So I'm just giving you this as a sort of backdrop to where the differences start to emerge between Francis and my own background. And we could multiply these narratives and multiply the differences in the initial experiences and origins of fellow African and Caribbean heritage health professionals in this current country. And that's one of the things I wish we could get over even better. The complexity of our heritage, the similarities of our heritage, not only with our fellow black colleagues in the health service, but with our white colleagues in the health service, that the, these boxes and these labels really uh, do cause issues. So when I was asked by what seemed to be a very old lady when I was very young, she was probably about 30, uh, where are you from, my dear? I said, Birmingham, with a real Brummie accent, Birmingham. 
no, 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 no. And she wagged her finger at me, I remember. No, 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 no. Where are you really from? And that question was constantly asked, sometimes very politely, the way Francis would have asked it. And I think the way I asked that question, we, we all want to know where people are from. But it's when our answer is challenged to make us feel as an outsider, like this lady who said, no, 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 no. So she didn't accept that I was from Birmingham. She didn't accept that I was black British. That is what caused anger to develop in me. And fast forward to say that that anger has proved to be very useful to me because I think looking back, because I'm now retired, I use that anger very positively. I don't know how I decided to do that. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, obviously I became a nurse and that was because I had a very good role model with a nun in the convent that I, I was in who cared for my very bad eczema by using distraction therapy to stop me getting pain when the dressings were taken off. And I always remembered that. I wanted to be like a, not a nun, but I discovered she was something called a nurse. It was the best decision I've ever made in my life. I, I am so happy to have had the nursing profession that I had, but there have obviously been issues. Fast forward, when I was a nurse, I chose to specialize in sickle cell anemia. Now, by this time, I'm a health visitor working in Northwest London. And one of my, the families that I visited on my, on my uh, caseload had a child, a young a little boy with sickle cell anemia. And the mother was distraught, crying, the care that the little boy was getting wasn't too bad. The pediatrician was very kind, she told me, but nobody was really explaining what this illness was to her. Nobody was really giving her the information to help her as a mother look after her child at home and take away this feeling of helplessness that she had. So she asked me questions. She saw me as a black health visitor, I, I, I would suggest. We got on very, very well. So she started asking. I couldn't answer the questions. I had never had a lecture in my nursing education, in my health visiting education. And I qualified in the 60s and early 70s in, in London. Sickle cell wasn't on the curriculum. That was another aspect that made me very angry. Just watching the time. That anger drove me to find out more about sickle cell anemia by going to the United States. The civil rights movement, the Black Panther movement, their involvement in getting sickle cell on the agenda was a boon to me, plus meeting a sickle cell nurse specialist in Los Angeles. I didn't realize nurses could play a part. I came back joined forces with Dr. Misha Brozovic, a consultant hematologist, and that's how I became the first sickle nurse specialist. So the, when I'm asked for advice, I, I don't really like giving advice, but one bit of advice I will give, particularly black health workers, use your anger positively. Don't let that anger eat you up. Use that anger, use the energy of the anger to improve the quality of care in whatever area that you have become interested in. Because that's what I did, thank goodness, because I didn't then have any sort of mental health breakdown. I didn't get a peptic ulcer. I did get high blood pressure, but it's managed beautifully. So we'll, we'll move on from that. So I really want to actually um, finish on that point because there's you know, other areas. But I think it's important to share how we have coped in the NHS, not how we have drowned in the NHS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dame Elizabeth. That was a very, very strong point you ended on in terms of how we have coped as opposed to drowned and channeling you know, our anger to drive positive change. And I think that's very important. There are also a few things that you touched on during your talk, which I'm hoping we'll get an opportunity to discuss later regarding the complexities being a black British healthcare professionals and what that means for, you know, people who are practicing now and who will be practicing in the future. So next I'm going to introduce our first, um, well, our panel for today. So the rest of our panel, 
joining this discussion. So first I'm going to introduce Mr. Jonathan Makonjuala. He is a consultant urological surgeon with a specialist interest in uro-oncology and renal stones. He's the deputy editor for the Journal of Endoluminal Endourology. He has a background in health technology with an interest in implementation and evaluation health IT systems. We also have with us today, Jacob Ogutumayin. He is an intercalating medical student and master's candidate at the London School of Economics and Political Science. His academic interests lie in healthcare system strengthening with experience working in clinical governments, governance at both a regional and national level. We also have with us Andrew Alalade, who has quickly been called back into theatre. Hopefully he'll be able to join us just a little bit later and I'll introduce him again then. And next we have Dr. Shegan Ned. She is a specialist registrar with an interest in pediatric emergency medicine and medical education. She is very proud of her Jamaican and Guyanese heritage and is committed to supporting a more diverse workforce. And last but not least, we have Dr. Rochelle Pierre. She's an anesthetic trainee and the founder of the British Caribbean Doctors and Dentists Network. She's passionate about inspiring the next generation. And Rochelle is also a trustee of the award-winning charity, Street Doctors. So you will have the opportunity to ask questions um, within the Slack group and that will be forwarded and hopefully we'll be able to ask our speakers this evening. But my first question that I would like to ask is, has there been enough emphasis placed on celebrating and recognizing the contributions of African and Caribbean healthcare professionals? And Jacob, if you'd like to answer this question. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much, Alamide. And it is a great honor to be able to share this platform with such established speakers and such established professionals in their own right. So I'll get straight into the question. So with regards to if there has been enough emphasis on the contributions of Afro-Caribbean healthcare professionals, I will have to say that the short answer is no. Um, simply, firstly, by the fact that the amazing stories that we've just heard just now from Dame Elizabeth and from Francis are stories that are few and far between. And sadly, we do not get the chance to hear and platforms haven't been created such that we can have a chance to engage with these stories and the lessons that can be learned from them. But as it was said in the introduction, my interest lies um, with regards to healthcare system strengthening. And I wanna to touch on what Frances said earlier in her talk and unpack that. And I'm sure we're gonna unpack that throughout the rest of this conversation. And I think the reason why we have seen all a plethora of reasons, but one of the reasons why we have seen a lack of celebration for this group of uh, healthcare professionals is sadly because I believe there's been a lack of compensation for this group. And when I say compensation, I don't necessarily mean in terms of financing, but also in terms of recognition, accolades and rewards of that like. And I'll explain that in terms of what is taking place at a healthcare system level. And just like Francis was speaking about earlier in terms of the impact that international recruitment is having, um, is having a disproportionate impact on low income countries, particularly in Africa and the Caribbean. And what we have seen is that there have been government uh, government level deals with regards to the UK and the Philippines, which ensure that, that these countries are being more adequately subsidized for these uh, exchange of healthcare workers. But sadly, we're not seeing that we have a lot of low income countries. Just a few statistics to back that up. For example, we know that there was around five countries who have expatriation rates of more than 50%. That means more than half of their workers are working outside of that country. Um, countries such as Sierra Leone, Liberia, Angola, Tanzania. We know that in one year, uh, we know that in one year that the UK, in terms of the savings that we're making from recruiting Ghanaian healthcare workers, it was actually more than the, the amount of funding that was being provided in terms of healthcare aid. And then finally, we know that at a time where Sierra Leone was voted one of the worst healthcare systems in, in the world, we know that the UK was hosting about 27 of their doctors and more than 100 of their nurses. So there's a significant impact that international recruitment is having on equity and is this having an impact that sadly we are, are not discussing enough. And I would say because of this lack of compensation, there's a, a lack of, of, of celebration because when we realize that there's a lack of celebration of the contribution, we subsequently may realize that there is a lack of adequate compensation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. That, that was a very, very interesting, um, some interesting points that you've raised. And so my next question um, to our, our panelists would be, what do you perceive to be 
the reason for underrepresentation. And to be honest, I'm I'm rethinking this question now whether it is a case of underrepresentation. But what do you perceive to be the reason for the underrepresentation of African and Caribbean healthcare professionals in the NHS? And we're going to start with Dame Elizabeth. Thank you, Olamide. And of course, that's the point I'm actually going to pick up. We're not underrepresented. We we we're, we're there particularly on the front line, as we have witnessed the impact from COVID-19. We are very much in the NHS in terms of our presence. However, we don't have the influence. We should, I'm talking we now in a <laughs> African Caribbean health heritage professionals in the NHS. We don't have the influence that we should have and we certainly do not have the re representation uh, at the various echelons within the health service, particularly the upper echelons. Now I know that there is a question later on in terms of leadership, so there, there will be overlap, but that is the crucial point, that the, there is significant representation within the NHS, but where is the problem? where they are in the NHS is the problem. Thank you very much, Dame Elizabeth. And Francis, would you like to just comment on this question also? Absolutely, but I thought I was going to be the one who was disagreeing. I, I absolutely agree with Elizabeth. We're not underrepresented at all. It's just that we are not represented in senior roles. And I had a look at some stats and in March, these are at March, 2019, Look, the percentage of NHS staff and the percentage of er working age population by ethnicity. So if we look at the Asian population, there's 10% working in the NHS out of a 7.2% working age population. For Blacks, and I'm taking that's all African Caribbean mixed up, 6.1% are represented in the NHS staff out of a population of 3.4%. So I do not think that we're underrepresented at all, but I think partly it's our fault. I think we just do, we just work. And I remember someone saying at a Mary, talk, talking about Mary Seacole, about why she wasn't as famous as perhaps um, Florence Nightingale. Now, Mary Seacole just did, but she never published. I think a lot of us just do and we don't make a big thing of it. And maybe it's time that we started to say, look, we are here and this is what we're doing and this is what we have done and this is what we will do in the future. I think we need to stand up and be counted. Thank you very much. And Rochelle, if you'd like to add some comments to this question. Yes, I think you muted. Yeah. Um, so I definitely agree with the points that have been made in terms of um, the NHS as a whole, um, but I think um, I'd like to focus a bit more on medicine um, and doctors. And I think um, coming from a Caribbean background, um, I've definitely noticed that there is a lot less Caribbean doctors um, within the NHS um, and dentists. Um, and I think that the reasons for this um, is quite multifactorial. Um, I think that a lot of Caribbeans, um, especially young people, their parents may be first generation migrants um, and they may, so a lot of Caribbeans when they came over um, quite young, a lot went into working roles rather than going into education. Um, and they may struggle to, um, sort of understand parts of the education system um, and to be able to offer to support to their children if they choose to sort of enter such careers as medicine. Um, I think young people may not know um, any other doctors um, and that creates a barrier for them because then they're unable to get experience, um, they're unable to get support with applications, um, they may not understand what they actually need to do for these applications. Um, so I think it's really important for organi organizations like Melanin Medics um, and ACMM who are helping um, these young people. Um, also looking at Caribbeans in education, um, 
I had a little read up on statistics and found that 27% of Caribbean students um, are likely to get top GCSE grades. Um, and they're amongst the lowest um, within the country. Um, so there's definitely a problem within education. Um, and I think that comes um, from socioeconomic factors, um, but also the support that they receive in school. Um, and I think uh, parents also need support um, to help their young people through education. So I think those are sort of the main reasons. Also, sorry, um, and there's also a lack of role models as well. Um, I think if you don't see somebody that looks like you in a role that you're considering, um, then it's harder for you to sort of see yourself in that role. So I definitely think um, increasing visibility, increasing role models will help uh, young people see a future in such careers. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And we are glad to have Dr. Alala Day back with us. Um, so Mr. Andrew Alala Day, he is a consultant neurosurgeon. He completed his registrar training in the North London North Thames rotation. His main interests include mentorship, encountering health inequalities. And so Andrew, just in addition to this question, um, Rochelle touched quite nicely on role models and we're aware that one of your interests is, uh, is it mentorship. Um, what role do you think mentorship plays in terms of increasing the representation of African and Caribbeans within the healthcare sector? Um, yeah, mentorship definitely plays a major role. Um, and I'll just use my kids, for example. So we've got two kids, 11 and 7. And just three days ago, precisely, we were having a chat about mentorship and representation. And my daughter, who's a great fan of, I think in school, she sang at one of the, the concerts for, and she had to sing, um, it was a song that was featured in Annie. That's the new Annie, not the old movie, because my wife really loves the old one. But my daughter loves the new one. And my daughter told me, she said, oh, daddy, I've been Googling. Um, the new Annie did not do as well as the old one. And I said, oh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a remake. You know, the remakes never do as well as the first ones. And my daughter was like, nah, I think it's because she's black, daddy. How did the girls of yesteryears cope? Like, I've got Annie to look up to. But how did mommy cope? Did mommy have people that looked like her on TV to look up to? And this is an 11 year old girl. Like I was a bit, I don't know. I was just a bit flabbergasted at the way, you know, the direction in which it was heading. Um, but we, we had a chat about it and she, she did tell me, she said, oh, I wonder how it must have been for you. Did you have a lot of people to look up to who were like you that all the movies you talk about they all seem to be like white people like not black people and and that's just that's that's a kid talking you know but there's a lot of truth in what she said now personally for me um one of the things I've always wanted to be a neurosurgeon and one of the things I did at the beginning was email so many neurosurgeons all over the country and um I didn't really get any black colleagues to speak to. And a few, I, I emailed two black colleagues, but they weren't really in senior positions and they were all on their way out of the UK anyway. Um, so it was, it was a bit discouraging. And as time went on, even the few blacks I knew, whenever I met them, they always talked about some big court case they were involved in or some medical legal problem. You know, in fact, one of them was featured on the front page of the Metro. So I counted them, they were about five. And if three people out of five have a big court case, why, why am I getting into a career like that? You know, that, and maybe because I was stubborn enough and loved neurosurgeons so much, but for a lot of other people, you can understand why you would easily get discouraged. And the same for my junior colleagues. Like now I've got a lot of junior colleagues who, are preparing for their exams. And one thing I always say is, oh, don't worry about the fellowship exam. It's so easy. And they're like, Andrew, what do you mean? And I'm like, you just have to have a structured way of doing it. Now, nobody told me that, but because I've done it, you know, I've done the exam, I've been part of um, the, what they call it, the revision course faculty. I know all the techniques. A lot of my other colleagues had people who told them that I didn't have it. I just had to figure it out on my own. 
But for my junior colleagues, they appreciate that so much. They, they would come, they would spend time, they would even take time off from work, come to the hospital, come and visit me and say, Andrew, you need to go through this. And it made me realize, I just thought to myself that, you know what, there are probably a lot of senior colleagues, a lot of even fellow colleagues who probably had that opportunity and I never had it. But now I'm here in a place of privilege to be able to help my junior colleagues. And those are the things that would help. Those are the things that translate. So when you look at the people at the top, you're like representation matters, you're not there, then you, you're just going to do a bit of a mental calculation. If there's no black person there, then it means I probably won't be able to get there. And that's what we do. We always calculate. It's a place of safety. So if I was reading, um, I know Francis and um, Professor Elizabeth did say it about numbers. So some, I read something a few weeks ago that um, said, Actually, we make up about 40%. If you look at doctors, nurses, social care workers, we make up 40%. That's a lot. But then if you look at the top bracket, we're literally nowhere to be found. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Jonathan, I don't know if you'd like to comment on this question also. Um, yes, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, for me personally, I agree with all the points that we made about representation. I mean, there are black um, and African and Caribbean uh, healthcare workers in the NHS. We know the numbers are there. But as Andrew picked up on, we're just not in powers of leadership to make an influence. Less than one percent of the NHS executives are black. You know, so when I go into a board, um, when I go into a boardroom as a consultant in my hospital, there are all white faces. If I have a, a point I want to make or something I want to introduce. There's less people like me that understand me, understand uh, what it's like to be black, that help to give me a chance to take things forward. We get, I mean, in our hospital, we get a Black History Month and there are one or two events that are happening. Um, but why can't we have things that, are, um, that happen throughout the year, basically? Why can't we have situations where we get local, I work in an area in South London, so I'm always actively inviting black children to come into my theatres for work experience to try and increase that representation. When I started as a consultant, there was only five black consultants in London. And I was one of them basically in the history of London, you know, on the fifth one, and this is 2019, 2020. So we just have to increase our representation, be there. But also sometimes I find as black and ethnic minorities, if we speak up, we're seen as troublemakers. Um, I've been working with the GMC recently and a number of black doctors that are referred to the GMC and struck off as disproportionately higher than our white colleagues. So there's a, there's a disconnect there. And I think we just have to push forward and try and improve the situation for those coming behind us. Thank you very much. And I think that leads quite nicely onto the next question that I'm going to ask. And that question is how can we actually push for a greater influence from African and Caribbean healthcare professionals to be in more leadership roles? And first I'm going to go to Dr. Shegan. Hi, thank you. Um, I think in terms of um, increasing kind of leadership roles, um, we sometimes have to look backwards before we look forwards. So I think one of the things is looking at visibility of um, the influences that have been there, but have sometimes not been highlighted. Um, I mean, I was very much interested in kind of finding out about um, African and Caribbean influences on medicine. I, I in school, um, did history of medicine um, as a GCSE subject. And the only influences that ever seemed to come up were, you know, ancient Egyptian medicine, um, and that was about it. Sometimes we got a nod to Mary Seacole, but there was nothing ever really fully in kind of curriculums, no nothing ever in museums, nothing that I kind of saw and could um, kind of identify with. And my dad was very kind of pro finding out your history and your roots and always encouraged me to find these um, role models. But this was an individual kind of family thing. And I think one of the things in order to, um, kind of empower people is to be, have, a, have visibility and an honest visibility. Um, I mean, there have been many people, there's Lord David Pitt, he was kind of the, the chair of the BMA um, in kind of the, he worked in the 1940s and the 50s, 60s, but nobody really knows about him. Um, we have um, further back, John Alkindor, we have so many um, different healthcare professionals, apart from Mary Seacol, but and even to say that it was only in 2016 that her statue was erected in um, St. Thomas's Hospital Courtyard. 
Um, and we're talking about, this is from the Crimean War, um, where she did her work in the early 1800s. Um, so I think one of the things is visibility. Visibility uh, in all sectors, um, not just um, kind of in our kind of medical Black History Month. I'm very um, careful not to just put things into a box of mentioning things in October for a showpiece and then putting it back in the box. It needs to be something that's integrated um, into our schooling, into our books. Um, there's many medical museums. I've never been to a medical museum um, that shows um, as part of its main um, collection, the contributions that Black and Caribbean and other ethnicities have made to the NHS. As was mentioned, um, the recruitment drives in the um, early 50s and 1948, uh, when the health service was first established, um, it couldn't have survived without the contributions of, of workforce from the Commonwealth. And I think it's really important to make sure um, that these people are highlighted and acknowledged. And one last thing I will say is, we live in a, a more digital age where we can see and um, have visual representations. And I think that's important. One of the things as a Caribbean, um, specifically I speak, um, many of our names are from colonial past. So we may have people in history um, that have been present and have been in leadership positions, but if they're not visualized, if we don't have reminders, we won't know our names are not always um, easy to tell us, um, uh, to tell our histories and tell our backgrounds. And I think having visibility is one of the things that will help to push us forward in that way. Thank you very much, Shagan. And um, Andrew, would you like to comment on, on this question also? Yeah, um, I think the main thing now is just to be quite participatory in things that happen in, um, in our different um, environments or in our workplaces. So, um, and, and, you know, we, we've got to ask, you know, do they have ethnic diversity committees? Do they have push yourself forward for laws? When laws come up, um, you, you've just got to go for them. Because there's one thing about um, us as the immigrant population is we, and I think someone mentioned it because I caught someone mentioning because we tend to work a lot. Um, we work hard, but we don't work smart. So you, and I can give myself as an example, who's the person who would come in probably more than everybody else? It will probably be someone who's um, an African or Caribbean. So you'd, you come in Monday to Fridays, you do the long hours, you know, but when the um, key role comes up, you'll find out that you don't get it, even though you've probably worked harder than, than most of your other colleagues. So it's all about um, putting yourself out there and, you know, making sure your voice is heard as much as you can, um, being involved when things come up, when key roles come up, and, and get to mentor other colleagues, because many times it might not even be for you, um, you know, but it's not, it's not even a position you might get to take, but at least there's a junior colleague who would come after you, and that's why a lot of groups like Melanin Medics coming up, because then you're making things better for even the next generation, and then there's a bit of a ripple effect and it spreads even far and wider. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. You, you touched on some great points there. Um, one regarding participation, which I think I'll, I'll probe a bit more about later on. But Rochelle, would you like to add your comments to this question? Um, yeah, so I agree with the comments that have been made. Um, I think mentoring is a major part in this. I think a lot of younger um, clinicians, um, students are not aware of the opportunities that are available to them in terms of leadership. Um, I became a trustee of the charity Street Doctors um, about six years ago whilst I was still at medical school. Um, and when I joined the trustee board, I had no idea what a trustee was. I didn't know what I had to do as a trustee. Um, and I think just educating people on um, what a leadership role entails um, and to give them confidence to apply to these roles because um, I think a lot of people might see these roles and be like oh I can't fulfill this role um, I don't know what to do in this role so I think mentoring um, of people who are in um, by people who are in um, leadership roles will really help um, the younger um, those that are coming through um, and I think also, again, the work of Melanin and Medics um, and also British Caribbean Doctors Network, um, we are sort of working to mentor each other 
um, as doctors um, and as dentists so that we're able to, you know, the senior clinicians are able to support the more junior clinicians um, and just give them that confidence to, you know, feel that they should be in a room. Um, they should be present in the room and that their opinions um, are valid um, and that they can enter into these leadership roles. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And so following on from, from your comments, actually, I do question whether it's, it's an issue of accessibility. You know, I was fortunate to be a HLA scholar um, and that was my first kind of exposure to leadership training of some sort. Um, and although I'm still quite early on in my journey, I am aware, of, you know, the NHS have programs in place to um, encourage the development of ethnic minority groups um, to, you know, enter leadership positions. Is it a case that this isn't enough? And Francis, would you like to just comment? Yes, thank you very much, Alamide. I, I wanted to just highlight that um, the NHS in England has had a nursing and midwifery black my minority ethnic um, BME leadership program going. But I don't know how successful it has been to be entirely honest. And it, it did acknowledge that nurses and midwives form the largest collective professional group within the NHS. But one in five are from BME backgrounds rising up to almost 40%, I think um, someone mentioned in some regions, you know, such as London, yet the opportunities and experiences do not always correspond so yes, there are programs. How do, do people access them? And how are they supported in accessing them? But I also wanted to just make a point about um, BME people being part of the NHS for ages. And I've only recently found this out. So, you know, I was, I'm guilty too, but um, I think as far back as 1932, uh, some work's been done by a social researcher called Stephen Bourne, and he, it's revealed that black nurses worked in the healthcare system long before the NHS was even thought of. And most would have been from the British Empire, Caribbean, India, and countries in Africa. Um, there's a, a nurse called Annie Brewster from St. Vincent, and she uh, worked at Whitechapel from 1881. And then there was a Jamaican nurse trained in St. Nicholas hospitals hospital from 1932. Now, I did not even know about those people. For me, it was 1948, but we've been around a long time. And I think we need to spread that story and to celebrate that we've actually been here a long time. And we're gonna be here for a long time. Thank you very much, Francis. And, and that's very interesting um, because I know during Black History Month, what one of our, um, projects as an organization was looking back in history and trying to to find you know the healthcare professionals that that served um way before the nhs and mm -hmm. i remember there are a few names that stuck in my mind um that shegan mentioned so lord pitt mm -hmm. he was um a chair of in the british medical association mm -hmm. also kofa warala pratt she was the first black nurse in the nhs and these are people that we don't hear about often oh. that it takes a lot of digging just to, to find their names and find out their contributions. I think that's something that can definitely be celebrated a lot more. Mm. Um, so I, I do have a question and, and this is based on pretty much everybody's comments, but a lot of the times for, for black healthcare professionals, when, when they do want to go for a leadership position and they attain it, they're tasked with, you know, opening the door, which can, can be quite challenging, but keeping it open. And this is aside from the challenges that they may, may may face on their career journeys and um, just in day-to-day -day life. And this can be quite quite taxing on the individual. Um, and I, wa I wanted to ask, how do you respond to, to those who aren't as willing to help others, um, who, who don't, who are just focused on, you know, their careers and trying to, to get ahead if, if possible. And it could be based on, on the challenges that they'd faced pre previously. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, Rochelle, Rochelle to answer that question. Sure. Um, I think it's a difficult one. I think you obviously can't force people to do something that they don't want to do. Um, but I think just highlighting that we are more than ourselves, like there's a whole world that's going on around us. Um, there's an, a younger generation who are going to need our help. Um, and also that 
you know, you're likely to have children um, and at some point they're going to need help and they're going to face some of the same um, difficult difficulties that you face going through your own career. Um, so even if it's you're only able to have, you know, one conversation with someone just to explain to them your story of how you got there, if you feel that you don't have, you know, enough time to fully mentor someone, but even just one conversation can change a whole person's experience. Um, and it can push them into directions that they never felt confident to go in or that they never thought about in the past. So I think just, you know, highlighting to them that everybody needs help at some point in their life um, and also highlighting that they probably didn't get to where they are um, without a little bit of help at some point. Um, and yeah, just trying to explain to them that it's, it's really important that we help the next generation through so that it's easier for everybody in the long run. Um, and then maybe, you know, generations down the line, people might not need as much help because it will be much more accessible. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And Dame Elizabeth, if you'd like to comment on this question. Thank you. I'd, I'd actually just like to go back a little bit. You were talking about Mrs. Pratt, um, uh, the, the Nigerian, um, very eminent Nigerian nurse. She's often called the first black nurse in the NHS. And I think this is actually a very interesting example of how myths can be created. How, how, who, where's the evidence that she's the first black nurse in the NHS? Uh, we've already highlighted, there is knowledge about black nurses pre-1948. It is scant and it makes me realize, and also looking at all of you, we need, a central resource, portal resource. And if the negative aspects of COVID-19 have impacted on us, there have been some positive impacts such as what we're doing tonight, the greater use of technology to share information and discuss. And I wonder if Organ organizations involved with this evening's event can link up with other uh, organizations uh, involved with black health professionals in, in the NHS. And you can get some funding. This, this, is a, this is an area that would attract funding. Heritage Lottery, I don't know. So where we could have a portal of information online to give us this sort of information because I admire what Mrs. Pratt did in nursing, don't get me wrong, but I, I do get a bit annoyed when I see people saying she's the first NA, black nurse in the NHS. Now, don't get me wrong, this is my anger, you know what I was talking about. So I understand why she's being called the first, but that, that's actually, hey, hold on. Do you mean to tell me in July 5th, 1948, Mrs. Pratt was the first black, NH, black nurse in the NHS? I do not believe that for one minute. So we should turn it around and say, it is quite important for us to have some idea of the presence of black, not just nurses, we're talking about African Caribbean NHS professionals, staff. Who else was around at the launch of the NHS on the 5th of July, 1948? What a brilliant project that would be do a big call out to all sorts, not Stephen Bourne, yes, but there are other people who have been doing a little bit of work, but a call out to anybody who knows a member of their family or a friend's family who was working in the NHS in 1948. And then you know what's gonna happen. We can go backwards and see who was there before the NHS was established, Never mind post NHS. So I'm an elder and in, our community, I can boss you all around. I can boss you so much. Could somebody really take this forward? Because what a beautiful resource it would be for our colleagues. But what about the youngsters coming through, which you have all highlighted so beautifully? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dame Elizabeth. And thank you for that correction as well. I think it, there's many questions that you raised there. One of them being just in terms of the documentation, you know, just because certain things weren't documented, how do you know that, you know, the difference 
differences and experiences before then, we, we're not sure, uh, which it is quite a shame, but it does present an area of opportunity, as you mentioned, and I'm sure that's something that can be further explored and will be further explored, fingers crossed. Um, so just going back to uh, the question that we were on, so how do you respond to those who aren't willing to help others? And Andrew, if you'd like to comment on this. Oh yeah, um, I think, I don't know, I've spoken to a few people like this and I think for some people it's, um, there's still a bit of, of fear, I think. So people are, because they got there, they got to a point of leadership or position of leadership and they, they, I don't think it was something they expected. Not many people want to speak out or say anything that will rock the boat. We've seen a few examples of whistleblowers. We know what can happen to whistleblowers, regardless of what race you're from. Um, so you suddenly find yourself in a position of leadership whether it was by merit, maybe in a few cases, whether it was tokenism, but you're, you're worried about rocking the boat. You know, you don't really want to uh, be the one person who suddenly opened the door for so many people. You're scared that, oh, who knows? I've got here, maybe in two months, I'll go back to the position where I, I was previously. So I think that's, that's the problem with, with um, you know, people who've got to, a point of leadership and I just worried about being seen um, paving the way for for other people how do we try to correct that well it's it's still all about communication and showing that listen it's all for the good of everyone um, regardless of where you are think of yourself as just one unit of a community it's a bigger community it's all about um, progression the British com um, constitution talks about you know improving things for everyone. And I personally think even for the NHS, the more people who you have looking forward to coming to work, having a, a safe place of work where you're not scared of being bullied, where you're sure that you can easily open up to people, um, then it helps not just you, it also leads to better outcomes for the patients you're, you're taking care of. Now, just a quick addition to what um, Dame said as well. In fact, Mary Sickle, I only found about her a few years ago. I think it was when I read your book and then I had to read up about her. Um, and we'll be surprised to know that, you know, because of, you know, colonialism, the first, um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm scared of using first now, um, but there were actually a lot of Nigerian doctors who were sent to the UK in the 1850s. So Mary Sickle helped after the Crimean War in the 1850s, but a lot of Nigerian doctors actually graduated from King's University of Edinburgh in um, 18, between 1850 and 1860. And they all worked in the British Army as staff assistant surgeons. They spent a couple of years in, um, in the UK before they went back to Nigeria. There were people like Africanos Horton, who is actually Igbo, um, but you know, spent his childhood in Syria alone. There's William Broughton Davis, um, who was Yoruba, who um, spent some time in Syria alone, spent some time as a staff assistant surgeon um, in the British Army. Those people spent about 30 years or so working in the British Army. So there are a lot of these people um, that are actually in history books. I've got a, 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 a paper on a couple of them that was written by Adeloye, who was Nigeria's second neurosurgeon, but he trained in the UK as well. So he had a compilation. And a lot of people, when you speak to them now, do not know about these people. So it, it, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. And I think it's a good idea to have, you know, some kind of archives that every, or resource, that's what you called it, where we can dig into. I know that as far back as 1850, 1850-something, there were black and Afro-Caribbean, you know, surgeons and doctors and nurses who were working in the NHS. We don't know about them because for some reason, even Mary Sickle, Mary Sickle with all the wonderful things that she did, um, you know, anyway, um, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Jonathan, if you'd like to add to this. Yeah, so in terms of how do I respond to people that are not willing to help others, I think we need to be radical now. I'm, I'm tired of kind of going to the same boardrooms and seeing the stale, same stale male pale faces, basically. People need to be held to account. So in my universe, in my hospital, we've just employed our first director of diversity, which is great. 
but I'm not really interested in tokenism. I want to, I'm going to meet her next week, find out what her plan is for the, you know, for the hospital. And then we're going to, we'll take her to task if that's not done. I think I'm tired of people just being inserted into roles and people just being comfortable, not doing anything. And we have to change the status quo. So I think people need to be accountable and have measurable things they can, that, that can be done to, to make sure that the people they serve and represent, i.e. the staff of the hospital, are, um, are seen to properly. So I think we need to be a bit more radical in what we do. Otherwise, nothing changes. And we just, we don't, we go one, two steps forward and one step back. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And I know more so from a personal perspective, you know, um, really kind of advocated for African and Caribbean healthcare professionals. What I found along my journey is that not everybody is going to be supportive. Not everybody recognizes that um, actually, you know, we need to push for diversity. We need to try and play our part and, and do what we can to, to, for this change to happen. Um, but Dame Elizabeth, I, I was wondering, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on this? Uh, thank you very much, Alamadi. And um, I, I would love to, I, I want to support Jonathan, this, this, this radical streak. I'm really pleased uh, with the example that he's given. Uh, but it is complex. And I realize I, I am quite impatient and I'm quite intolerant at times. And I've had to learn a few lessons from people quietly behind the scenes, revealing to me some of the reasons, you know, because they have been challenged. They, they are in senior positions we don't see the results. Uh, we can't lay it all at the door of such individuals, but we don't see them publicly, do you know what I mean? Articulating the issues, um, giving us outcomes of the, 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 the institution's activities for which they have a role and they may have the label as you uh, gave the example, Jonathan. So they, some of them do need to be called to account. However, I, uh, part of me also thinks I would like to work with those people who do want to support the agenda uh, from our community, from our community who want to support the agenda, who, who have achieved and want to give back um, or, 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 or help, you know, just help others. And where do we put our energies? Do we put our energies in getting really irritated with those that are, don't appear to be supporting their communities? Or, and or do we give our energy to those who are looking for ideas on how they can do more? Now, I have to be honest, partly from a psychological point of view, from my own psychological well-being, I tend to prefer to work with those that wish to get more advice on strategies to further the action that they can take you know, um, be involved with to improve the uh, experiences for black uh, health professionals. And I think it's because I've realized that you have to limit what you can do if you want to avoid burn burnout, if you want to avoid psychological distress at not being able to understand why certain people who you feel are in a position to further the agenda do not appear to be doing it. And just going back to some of those individuals that have spoken to me privately, of course, you know what's going to, you know what I'm going to say. They've revealed issues about previous experiences or current fears that they have as to why they're not. It's not some of them. It's not because they don't want to. It's because they've had their fingers burnt, as somebody told me. Others, they, they, they don't want to be late. They don't want people to. Um, view them just what's that expression that we have um, to, to be to there is a beautiful expression that they don't want their um, they don't want to be viewed just because of their color there is a better expression of it than that and so sometimes you have to say well it's obviously you've got some inner tensions going on inner conflicts co cognitive dissonance going on here you need to get support to help you work through that. And if you trip up or if you have uh, negative consequences, mentorship, somebody that you can turn to that can give you support because there's so few of us that have reached positions of leadership. We have to put that ladder up and help others. 
but you also need help if that has caused you negative consequences. So I have learned to be a bit more uh, humble, actually. I, I think sometimes I've been a bit harsh with certain individuals because I didn't understand why they weren't doing things that they should be doing, well, I thought they should be doing anyway. And I think also there are different ways that we can contribute. It may not be the obvious way, speaking on a platform or people can use their writing skills, their, their, their vlogging, blogging, what, <laughs> their IT skills. It's not, we don't all do it in the same way. That's the lesson I've had to learn. It's a very painful lesson because I suppose it's a bit selfish and a bit big headed. You think some of the things that you've been able to achieve by being angry, by getting onto a platform, by causing tension at a board meeting or on a platform where you've been speaking. Yes, it is uncomfortable and we do get backlash. Of course we do. But actually, though, we've seen improvements happen as well. And I think it's trying to share those sort of experiences that some of it will be negative, the impact, the feedback, but actually look what happened because a group of us did this. And actually maybe I'll finish on this. We can't do it on our own. It's to have alliances. And those alliances can be black and white, but you as the black individual in a position of privilege, position of leadership, need to pull those alliances together. Don't expect other people to do it. You have, a, you have a responsibility to do that. Thank you very much, Dame Elizabeth. And I think it's really important that, that you spoke about, you know, the impact on an individual's well-being and just how important it is to actually move as a group and strategize, play to our strengths. What, what can we do to, to make a difference? And it may seem like a, a drop in an ocean, but it's all the drops that make the ocean at the end of the day. So I think that was very important to recognize. And Shagan, if you'd like to comment on this also. Um, yeah, I think I, I would agree. And I just wanted to touch on um, what Dame Elizabeth and Jonathan were saying. I think it is um, about harnessing more of a group mentality. Sometimes we're each individually trying to kind of reach our goal or um, and, and not always providing the support um, that each other needs. And also to recognize that support isn't kind of from a senior position to a, um, a less senior position that actually we can mentor and support each other at different levels. Um, and it's also thinking our partnerships as group kind of um, clinicians or practitioners or healthcare professionals is one thing, but also um, working in terms of getting measured um, approaches at looking at our organizations that we work for and our professional bodies, our Royal Colleges. Um, I mean, I wanted to highlight, um, I'm a member of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. And at the moment I've been kind of really astounded more recently um, to see that actually it's not just about talk. Um, we have had a, a report just in the last month put out called Putting Ladders Down, where there has been real honest look at the disparities in terms of um, ethnic uh, minority representation in their voluntary roles for the Royal College. And there are timed, um, kind of targets to meet and different strategies in place. And I think it's really important that we hold accountable um, the organizations that we're working for. Um, that may mean that we need group support to do that, to make sure that our voices are heard. One thing that I heard about um, diversity and inclusion that I always like to kind of um, share in these kind of um, places is that actually sometimes we're looking at diversity and we've, we've spoken so much about how diverse actually our workforce is but I think we kind of also need to move on a bit more than just the term diversity um one thing I say you know you might be invited to a party a dinner party and if I'm invited and kind of different people from every race are invited then you could take a picture and we're diverse um but it's a next step to make sure that everybody has the right size chair that they need to reach the dinner table to get food it's another step to make sure that everybody's actually allowed to partake in that meal, to be included, um, to join in conversation. So I think diversity is one thing, but we need to make sure that we hold um, our organizations accountable, that we group collectively together to support one another, to make sure that we're not just focusing on kind of diversity aspect of things, but making sure that actually um, we have partnerships to um, be inclusive and be kind of partakers and also influences in in our um, places of work thank you 
Thank you very much, Shagan. And I think um, it's, it's really important to remember that when the NHS was established, you know, it wasn't established with um, African and Caribbean communities in mind. They were not the immediate priority. And although the NHS has diversified significantly over the years and you can find African and Caribbean individuals contributing to healthcare in the United Kingdom from years ago, I think it's really important to, to hold institutions accountable. And we need to know what change looks like. What, what, what do we want change to look like? What are we working towards? What are the outcomes that, that we desire to see? And Francis, if you'd like to comment on this question. Well, actually, I wanted to comment on something Elizabeth has already commented on, and I, but I would say in, in less words, um, it was Jonathan who talked about, you know, being active in uh, mentorship and so on. But I know that I'd rather have a mentor who wants to be a mentor than a mentor who doesn't really want to do it and, and, and is feeling coerced because that's not going to do me any good. It's not going to do them any good. So how do we set up something that supports people who have the potential to be mentors? Maybe they're scared, as Elizabeth said, a bit burnt to help them to do it. But don't please put me with somebody who doesn't want to be a mentor because I don't want to I don't want to be there. Thank you very much, Francis. And I'm just going to move um, on to our next question. And this is one more so regarding our identity. Um, and so this question says, how can we create an environment where individuals are empowered by their cultural heritage and do not perceive their cultural differences to be a barrier in the way they relate to other healthcare professionals? And I'm just going to ask Shegan to comment on this first. Um, I think we've, we've, we've touched on some of the things that I would say is um, kind of having kind of visibility, um, knowing your history and being able to be proud of that and, and gain confidence from that. Um, also having support and a support network. We, as we've mentioned, some of the groups that are around, there are various others um, of like-minded people that can, one, act as role models um, for people who have uh, reach the levels that you may aspire to um, and help to kind of direct you to build your own self, being kind of um, proud of who you are, um, unique and, and kind of maintain your unique quality, but also confident in your skills and your ability to um, kind of utilize your, your gifts in the um, place that in, in your remit of work. Thanks. Thank you, Shagan. And Rochelle, if you'd like to add to this question. Um, so I think, again, as Shagan said, um, we need to support each other. I think it's really important. Um, I've been in situations where I've been like the only black person at my level um, or the only black doctor in the room. Um, and sometimes I find those situations quite intimidating. Um, but I think since being part of the British Caribbean Doctors Network, um, we've kind of created a network of like-minded individuals and we support each other through, you know, different difficulties. We're able to talk about things that happened at work um, that we may not have felt that we're able to talk to our um, white colleagues or um, colleagues from other races. So I think, first of all, starting with creating a network of support for each other um, and also just looking at the black community um, as a whole, I feel like a lot of the time we don't support each other. Um, and I think we've, we've touched on this throughout the conversation in that um, people say, you know, one person has got through, but they don't want to open the door for others. Um, but I think if we just take a look at other races, um, you know, such as Asian, Chinese, they seem to support each other a lot through um, businesses, um, even just looking for example, at um, consultants within a hospital. Um, we know that to get certain consultant positions, it's, it's a lot about who you know. Um, and you can see in some hospitals, there are you know, a certain race who have more consultants than others. And I think um, just by us sort of supporting each other, um, providing this network, getting to know each other, um, it will build confidence within ourselves um, so that we can then go out and educate other people about our cultures um, and about, you know, differences in our cultures. Um, and that will then create a safe environment for us if others are aware of our cultures um, and it will allow for different conversations to be had. Um, I think a lot of people are, especially through this whole um, Black Lives Matter, um, people 
I've noticed have been afraid to start certain conversations um, sort of with um, other black people or you know with um, if they're non-black they've been afraid to start conversations with black people and I think a lot of black people are open to these conversations um, but it's about creating that environment where others feel encouraged to come and talk to us um, and yeah I think that's just by supporting each other and educating um, people from other races. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And I think you spoke really nicely about um, just how what you're encountering can actually support somebody who is to come after you or who may face that same challenge. And Dame Elizabeth, I really wanted you to comment on this question. Um, and I remember seeing, um, so Dame Elizabeth was awarded the Pride of Britain Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. And I remember seeing the picture and Dame Elizabeth had the most beautiful Nigerian outfit on. She had her gele, she had her traditional clothing. And I was just like, wow. And it kind of inspired me today with my top. <laughs> but I just wanted you to touch on this question in terms of how can you make sure that we're empowered by our cultural heritage and not perceiving our cultural difference to be a barrier? Thank you very much, Alameda. I think we have to share our own journeys, if we've had those journeys, of where we've come to terms with our identity and we've, we've, we've we've understood why, I, I'm obviously talking about my own personal experience, but I, I've discovered through pre-COVID going around um, uh, and speaking at so many events up and down the country uh, for the last four years since my memoirs came out, that th th these issues resonate with so many of our colleagues within the NHS. I'm talking about black colleagues in particular. And that is the fact that people are so pleased and surprised at times because we all put people on pedestals. We are, we are all a culture to, if we've got a title or somebody's got a title, be it doctor or whatever, you know, there's a barrier there. And we all have these stereotypical assumptions, all of us, of how somebody must have reached that level. They must have come from a position of privilege. They must have money. They, mu they, they, they must, they must, they must. We, I think we all fall into that trap, I would say. And so I think those of us who have achieved what we have achieved in our profession, if we have the opportunity, as you are doing with this event, is to share and, and be as honest as we can. Now, the level of honesty has to rest with the individual. Nobody should dictate what somebody discusses or not on a public platform. But there's, uh, the, it is obvious just from my own experience, <clears throat> and I have been surprised at this, I have to be honest, <clears throat> how much revealing, for example, washing my face 10 times as a child to be white like my friends in the children's home or um, the, 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 the slightly humorous accounts about my hair, but there were deeper issues in terms of why did I do what I did, etc. But more importantly, the growing awareness that I have had through my life for all sorts of reasons that has made me comfortable with who I am comfortable with being mixed race, not being ashamed that my mother is white, not being ashamed that my mother, my father was black, not being ashamed that they weren't married, you know, um, explaining to people why I chose to, having had my mother's maiden name, I chose to take my father's surname, even though I couldn't pronounce my father's surname when I first met my father. Um, why did I take those steps? I explain it because I know the inner confidence that that gave me in my 30s, took till my 30s for this. But the positive outcomes of having this inner confidence, not arrogance, confidence about who I am and 
basically, I don't care whether you think I'm inferior to you or blah, blah. I don't actually care. I don't tell the people that. But inside, I've got these little voices going on and on and on. I don't care. I know who I am. And thank you very much. I now realize I'm not a bad person. I'm not an ugly person. I'm actually quite bright. I mean, I'm talking about myself. Now. <laughs> but what I'm saying is how many of us are aware of making use of the positive attributes that we have. They're all different. All our attributes are different. And what's, what I'm finding is that people are very open with me saying that it's made them feel more confident about who they are and not to be ashamed about aspects of their culture and recognize that actually when they were growing up, there were certain experiences that made them feel negative about their culture, whether it was the shape of their nose, their hair, their skin color, you name it. And to be, for us to have the honesty to reflect back on our lives and realize what has hurt us, what has negatively impacted on us that can make us negate some aspects of our cultural heritage or heritages, as in, as in many people's cases. To get to that position where we're very happy about who we are, and that will then make us relate to other people on a much calmer, more confident level and actually enjoy our lives a hell of a lot more. I must, sorry, I shouldn't use that expression, but you know what I mean. So I hope that has been helpful. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And quickly before we close, Jacob, would you like to comment on this? Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to hone on, on what Dame Elizabeth has said and others in terms of really appreciating the power of our lived experiences. And I think there's a real onus on us as individuals of Afro-Caribbean heritage to utilize our platforms. So for example, you know, in medical education where we use like patient experts to, you know, explore their, their experiences of a particular condition, I think there's a real onus on us as individuals to bring that same, bring it our experiences to life for our fellow colleagues who are not of the same heritage. That could be through various platforms like we've discussed, um, whether it be through organizations such as Melan Melanin Medics, um, but it can also be simply through conversation. And I think we should just not underestimate the power of our lived experiences and uh, like, and, and really transforming that into conversation that can create fruit and productivity. Thank you very much, Jacob and Jonathan. Um, I just want, yeah, I'd say you have to be very intentional in what you do. So for example, we had, um, I invited some doctors from Nigeria to come into my hospital to do some teaching and training. And that was very intentional in terms of where I select people from to come. Um, I'm a proud black man, I'm Nigerian heritage. Everyone at work knows I'm Nigerian because I'm always talking about Nigerian. We, we have food at the end for dinner. And I just want to show people this is me and this is who I am, basically. And, it, and if you have that confidence, it can then relate to other people. Thank you. And Francis, if you'd like to comment. Oh, on yeah, I, I just wanted to give a, a, an anecdote about identity. My youngest son, when he was about four, he came home from school and he said to me that he, one of the children in his class had said, your mom's a Paki. And he said, no, she's Jamaican. So I think it's getting your identity right from when you're young. And he wasn't upset and he could tell that child, actually, you got it wrong and she's Jamaican and I love her and this is fine. And I wanted to say to Andrew, I think it was Andrew who talked about his 11 year old girl and Annie, my two grandchildren who are four and two, they love the new Annie, okay? They love it. Thank you very much, Francis. And that brings us to a close. From today's discussion it's been absolutely incredible just hearing from all of our amazing panelists and I'd like to thank the HLA for this opportunity to really just host this discussion and there is a lot of tangible action that we can take from this discussion including finding out more about our history and without further ado I'd like to hand back over to Johan Malawana. Thank you. And thank you to the whole panel for joining us and discussing this vital topic. Francis said, we have been here for a long time and will be here for a long time. I look forward to making sure that young clinicians like Olamide and, and Jacob, Segna and Rochelle will be the ones that will follow the trail that has been blazed by Elizabeth and Francis and currently the incredible role models that Jonathan and Andrew are. In the week that we have seen Kamala Harris give the world hope with examples of people breaking barriers, I really am grateful for, Melanin, for the Melanin Medics team working with the HLA Live team to showcase our incredible colleagues and friends as role models, not just for the ethnic minority clinicians, but all clinicians. 
I wanted to personally thank Olamide and the panel on behalf of the whole HLA community for tonight. HLA Live is thanks to the wider team, as well as, uh, as, well as Eamon, Riddy, Alistair, Adil, Tim and Pedra for their incredible work delivering the HLA Live programme. We are incredibly lucky to have scholars that want to make a significant impact on healthcare across the globe and use the HLA as a platform to bring their incredible ideas and innovations to fruition. If you are interested in the work of the HLA, do make sure you catch a future HLA live episode, join us at a HLA event or apply to one of our programmes or best still become one of our HLA scholars. Thank you for joining us. I'm Johan Marlwina and it's a good night from all of us.